Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the esteemed FaceTime with Leaders, an initiative by World Development Corporation. I'm Sunny Bancholi, anchor at World Development Corporation. FaceTime with Leaders is a platform for industry titans to share their experiences, thoughts, ideas, and best practices in order to inspire one another and future leaders. In a nutshell, we attempt to encapsulate the multi-decadal learnings acquired by these industry leaders. We also hope that by conducting these FaceTime with Leaders interviews, we can bring together a global community of eminent personalities. By bringing together such visionaries on one platform, we hope to play a part in inspiring the lives of other leaders. Great learnings from great leaders undoubtedly assist everyone by identifying, nurturing, and using the trade secrets that are proven success formulas for many. And this is what we aim for with these sessions by making them a gathering of industry stalwarts and a knowledge sharing community. We have one such industry giant on FaceTime with leaders with us today, Mr. Milind Patke. He is a distinguished executive with a career spanning over three and a half decades and stands as a visionary leader in the biofuels and energy sector. Renowned for his exceptional prowess in marketing, brand building and biofuel innovation, his journey exemplifies a commitment to excellence and a relentless pursuit of value creation. His tenure at Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited, BPCL, a Maharatna public sector enterprise, has witnessed his impactful leadership across roles, including as Executive Director in Biofuels, Chief General Manager in Brand and PR, and President for Assets and Services. At present, he is giving his invaluable service to GPS Renewables Limited in the capacity of its president of biofuels, Pune, spearheading the startup in the field of sustainability, helping through its goal and re realizing its promising nature. Welcome to FaceTime with Leaders, Mr. Milin. Thank you. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. So to begin with, could you let our viewers know in brief about your career journey so far? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, after my engineering from Delhi College of Engineering in 1983 and uh, uh, doing one stint here and there, I joined Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited as a technical uh, officer, a trainee technical sales officer. Uh, my idea was that I wanted my engineering to be the base for doing anything that I do in life. And that is how I joined the technical services in the marketing division uh, because Petroleum products also is a technical selling. It not, it's not just, uh, you know, pure selling of uh, petrol diesel, but lubricants require a lot of technical selling. So my premier experience of uh, first eight years or so across uh, the northern region of the country and the eastern region of the country uh, was uh, into the technical services, wherein I uh, showed almost all types of industries, B2B, and... Uh, you know, I could uh, give technical services to all steel plants, automobile industries, heavy engineering industries, tea industries, uh, ceramic industries uh, for usage of lubricants, troubleshooting uh, in case something goes wrong, development of new lubricants and trials uh, with uh, new lubricants. So all that uh, happened in first eight years, wherein I was uh, leading the eastern region as a head of eastern region for technical services. Subsequently, I switched over to the technical plus commercial in the Western region, that is Pune. And then uh, for almost four years, it was primarily retail marketing. So from a B2B, I switched over to B2C and also B2B. So B2C and B2B, entire uh, the Western Maharashtra I was handling. Uh, subsequently, I was the division manager for uh, Ranchi, uh, the Jharkhand area now. Uh, and then I became the regional manager for the lubricants for the entire eastern region. Uh, so, so there uh, obviously uh, huge challenges. Uh, it was uh, a communist uh, union that point in time, and then we had a plant there, and you know, uh, doing a whole lot of changes in the plant and all. There was uh, huge challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, but we were able to increase our market share. Uh, record the best uh, possible growth in the industry compared to all our competitors, enter the markets of Nepal and Bhutan, uh, you know, and consolidate our place. Uh, subsequently, of course, I moved again uh, with um, uh, promotions and all that. I moved as head of supply chain for the entire lubricants business. 
wherein I uh, exposed myself to the inter international arena of uh, procurement of uh, base oils from the world market. Uh, I had to visit uh, Dubai and London, uh, some of these places, and uh, enter into tie-ups with uh, the uh, lubricant traders and the marketeers, uh, base oil marketeers. And uh, so head of supply chain was something that gave me an insight into how uh, product is manufactured and the entire supply chain from procurement to, to uh, storing, warehousing, uh, then uh, production, and then finished product warehousing, secondary transportation, and ultimately reaching the product to the field. Uh, so four years of supply chain, and then I moved as uh, uh, various facets of marketing before I took over as All India Marketing Manager uh, with, uh, you know, complete understanding of SCM, complete understanding of technical services. Here I was leading the entire B2C, B2B across the country. Uh, and uh, that gave me a huge confidence in terms of B2C and B2B marketing of a most competitive product at that point in time, lubricants, because the entire industry of lubricants were deregulated in 1992. And uh, I worked in lubricants till 2011, 12 almost. And thereafter, company uh, chose me to head their CRM project. Uh, company launched an initiative of customer centricity. And uh, in that, uh, my job was to ensure a collaboration at the field level between various business units so that we could sell all our products to one customer by collaborating uh, with each other at the field level and also at the back end, uh, digitizing it. The And the first move was to create a seamless customer service. Uh, you know, So we had one toll-free number. I conducted 64 pilots in 64 cities in the country where you know we regrouped all our front-end sales officers and uh, you know uh, we mapped all the customers and then we ensured that customers requirements reach us in the back end and uh, we had one toll free number through which we were doing the grievance redressal of the customers so the entire experience of you know the uh, customer centricity was a huge huge bonus and uh, as a natural progression then company made me an in charge of all india brand and corporate uh, pr head uh, for an oil and gas industry uh, it's extremely important because we deal with uh, inflammable products. We have refineries, we have marketing installations, and uh, at all times we have to keep vigil and ensure that nothing untoward happens. And uh, you know the assets are taken care of, the society is taken care of, and uh, so therefore brand and corporate PR was a huge responsibility. Uh, that gave me a chance to work very closely with the board of directors, the chairman himself because I had to ensure that the chairman's interviews and the director's interviews uh, appear in the newspapers and appear in the media and you know, we get a proper uh, brand recognition uh, for our company. And then we are able to differentiate ourselves vis-a-vis -vis other competitors. And that was uh, a huge um, responsibility on my shoulders that I need to create a differentiation at all times. Uh, and after a stint uh, of brand and PR, uh, then I also then... Uh, had one stint in the upstream marketing, President Assets and Services. And uh, that is when I handled the Brazilian and the Russian assets. And uh, I was uh, also nominated on the board of one of the Russian companies where we made the investments. Uh, we still have our investments in Russia. And uh, so after that brief, uh, almost one, one and a half a year stint, I moved again back to the marketing. And then uh, when I became elevated as executive director, uh, for the health, safety, and environment. That is when I came in touch with the sustainability and the environmental aspects of our business where, you know, uh, the climate change initiatives were being talked about, the Paris uh, meeting was being talked about, and it was my responsibility to ensure that uh, going forward, uh, we start looking at how do we reduce emissions, the scope one level, the scope two level, scope three level, and being oil and gas ourselves, being marketeers of fossil fuels, it was a huge challenge for us to really uh, do something in this area. And that is when my journey of the environmental and sustainability aspects that started there. Uh, as a natural progression, then I moved into biofuels and then biofuels uh, gave me an area where I could work on. Uh, and I was the ethanol coordinator for All India, uh, worked across uh, the with Ministry of Petroleum and with other uh, IOC, HPC, and other oil companies to ensure that we 
carve out a roadmap for first 10% blending and then 20% blending of ethanol across the country. Uh, we also, uh, BPCL was also a co-author for Satat along with Indian Oil for launching the Compressed Biogas Initiative. So all that was rolled out uh, during that time. And uh, I finally retired in uh, the June 21st. And that's when I then decided to join uh, the GPS Renewables after my retirement, where I could uh, really uh, pursue uh, compressed biogas uh, plants, you know, uh, throughout the country, work with a startup, work with young promoters, and then lend my services to them, uh, help them into strategy building. And uh, so th that's where I am now, right now. Mr. Malin, thank you for the excellent start to this interview. And I must say, your career journey is truly inspiring. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Yeah, I thank you so much. Yeah. So continuing our conversation, our viewers would like to know, what are some of the biggest achievements you have made with your leadership skills? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, having worked across all four regions of the country, I had huge challenges. Uh, the challenges on the HR front were also there when I worked in the Eastern region. And uh, that is where the, the uh, revamp of our budge budge installation, the modernization, uh, reducing the manpower when SAV was implemented were huge challenges for me because the workers simply would not listen to me saying that, no, uh, you can't reduce manpower. Uh, you understand, it was mainly a communist uh, union that point in time. I'm talking about the early 2000s. And uh, holding discussions with them, negotiations with them, ensuring that uh, nobody loses a job, but, you know, the people are uh, put into uh, an alternate job. A uh, lot of value was created out of the jobs. And then uh, SAP was implemented. The budge budge was modernized. Uh, we brought in new machines from Italy where the number of people required were less. So the others were moved out into uh, the other positions. And that was one huge challenge. It was done very successfully. Uh, second was as uh, head of uh, OEM in different stints. Uh, I was able to uh, really get B2B approvals for lubricants, which are even till date. For the last 30 years, they are buying products from uh, our company. Uh, specific product developed for specific applications for whether it is Atlas Copco, whether it is Kerlos Oil Engines, whether it is TVS Motors, whether it is Honda Motors, Honda uh, Motorcycle Company or Hero Honda at that point in time. So all this was uh, led by me. Uh, at different points in time, whether I was at Pune or whether I was posted at Delhi or whether I was posted at Bombay, uh, were led by me. And that gives me a huge satisfaction uh, because till date, these businesses are still running. I'm sure there would have been competitors. I'm sure there would have been people. But then we were able to carve out a niche for ourselves in terms of technical and then a commercial offer. And uh, therefore, these companies found us uh, not replaceable. Uh, the next uh, implementation was... Um, uh, having uh, worked in SEM, we implemented an uh, optimizer solution on the SEM. And for a running plant to implement an APO, advanced planning and optimizer solution, was a big challenge. Uh, without stopping the plant for a day, but building the entire uh, SEM APO platform in the background and then uploading the data and then seamlessly transferring into the new system, that was led by me when I was in charge of SEM. Uh, then, of course, energizing brand rewards when I was in brand. Uh, and uh, that was a huge experience. I'll talk about it separately. But before that, uh, the running of 64 pilots for customer centricity, uh, single-handedly going to each of these 64 cities across the country and ensuring that we have a very focused group in the front end who only e eat and breathe uh, petroleum products day in and day out and are in touch with customers on a daily basis to know exactly what is the right customer profile and how do we get new customers, how do we ensure that existing customers are retained. I think this entire successful running of Pilot from a leadership perspective was very, very important. And uh, finally, when I came into biofuels, yes, uh, ethanol coordination for the oil industry, ensuring that we lift the country's percentage from 2% to 5%, by the time I left, it was close to 10%. Now it is, of course, 12%. So, uh, you know, uh, coordinating with the entire oil industry, coordinating with the entire ethanol vendors, the sugar industry, and the sugar uh, ministry, the Ministry of Petroleum, uh, it was a huge experience. It was a huge experience. So these have been some of my uh, leadership uh, you know, uh, the, the instances where I could lead, by example.
that sounds incredible so building on to that uh, mr milan you have had the honor of participating in the energizing brand awards yeah our viewers would like to know how you went about achieving it yeah actually you know what happened that uh, when i was in brand uh, and when i was discussing with various stakeholders uh, one idea came to our mind and then we built on that idea was that if bharat petroleum has to build a differentiation for itself okay everybody has lubricants everybody has petrol everybody has diesel it's very difficult to differentiate you know the products but i think we could differentiate ourselves through our, how we come across to a, an ordinary consumer on the street and that's when we decided that we will uh, you know uh, align ourselves with some of the social initiatives which are being taken by people who are faceless it could be a young 5 year old or 10 year old fellow or it could be a 80 year old uh, lady uh, walking in some uh, remote part of the country uh, but doing something for the country whether it is in terms of uh, augmenting the ground water uh, or or planting more trees or 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 teaching a few kids here and there or computer literacy it could be anything so we said okay we must uh, ensure that if there are such people in the country we must bring them on one platform and recognize their efforts so and we could become a uh, basically uh, sort of a catalyst in that generation and it could uh, and if we could launch an award you know some 10 awards or something were given that year and we said we can have it every year or after every two years or something it also coincided with 40th foundation day of uh, the bharat petroleum so we decided to do our 40th foundation day in 2016 um, you know uh, launching these energizing bharat rewards and in these energizing rewards uh, we you took the social media platform and we just spread out messages to people that you please come back to us with your stories what you have done and then we had scheme of juries and uh, uh, the juries at two or three different levels and finally there was a jury who selected the best eight or 10 people and this jury is considered of uh, people like uh, uh, Vivek Debroy and um, people like that from Niti Aayog and all that. So people of that caliber, uh, they were there. I don't remember now all the other judges, but Vivek Debroy is someone I I do remember. And uh, then therefore, and then finally we selected some eight or ten people who had done remarkably uh, different work in their sphere. Uh, as I told you, it could be teaching, it could be doing something, it could be demonstrating, and making an innovative product or something. So these were then facilitated uh, at one of the uh, places in Mumbai. Uh, it was done at the hands of Petroleum Minister himself and our chairman and board of directors. So we actually, uh, you know, had a three-hour program wherein we called all these people. We sp uh, spent money for towards their accommodation in Bombay and all that uh, travel as well as accommodation, and ensured that they get that acknowledgement, uh, recognition uh, that uh, they deserve. Uh, and so this was one uh, moment I started. My idea was, uh, had I remained in that department, would have continued every year. Company does realize, but it's a mammoth task doing something like this on a year-on-year -year basis. But I'm sure company is thinking on these lines, and um, there are many such initiatives being taken at the uh, CSR level. Yeah, but but this was slightly different platform. Uh, this was basically to recognize the innovation in the field of uh, social development, uh, societal development and align the brand building uh, efforts of Bharat Petroleum along with it. That was the idea. Amazing. So, Mr. Milan, your commitment to the sustainability space is really commendable, given your service in the field of biofuels, etc. Uh, having worked in the non-renewable energy sector, how and when did you develop an interest in renewable energy? Yeah, actually, you know, when I was uh, first told that I am going to lead this uh, biofuels initiative, uh, my first reaction obviously was one of disappointment uh, because uh, obviously biofuels has not taken the initiative but then i had a chat with my board of directors and they said this is a unique opportunity for you to do something spectacular and uh, because the entire industry uh, with the kind of climate change initiatives and all that is looking forward to a leadership and then i realized that it's really a leadership challenge that if i can do something here and uh, initiate something uh, it, it, it's like, uh, you know, initiating something and then ensuring that the rest of organization follows. Uh, and some in oil and gas industry, which is mainly fossil fuel based, to talk of biofuel was very, very difficult. But then we were able to conceive a second generation ethanol plant 
uh, and then uh, we got the investment uh, board approval for the investment of second generation ethanol and now that plant is coming up it's going to get commissioned this year uh, it's a huge plant uh, coming up in orissa uh, similarly on the ethanol front uh, i was able to galvanize the efforts of the uh, sales people uh, we were able to get all the vendors on board get more people to put up ethanol plants get them to make more ethanol um, then uh, you know divert from sugar to ethanol and uh, get ensure that uh, more ethanol is available for the industry for blending in petrol so that kind of an initiative uh, really helped me get into the uh, the technical aspects of biofuel number 1 and number two, the challenges, the challenges in terms of setting up a parallel supply chain. It's no joke setting up a parallel supply chain for ethanol. How do we ensure that these two supply chains merge so that there is a seamless uh, availability of biofuels to the customers? So those are the kind of challenges. Uh, as far as compressed biogas is concerned, it's a completely different ballgame. Uh, today, natural gas is a very centralized uh, way of operation where a gas comes at the coast and then it puts put into the pipeline and the pipeline is wherever the pipeline goes it can feed the consumers it's a very centralized way of working as against this compressed biogas is a very very decentralized way that you put up a small plant and just uh, feed the people in the vicinity of that plant then put up another plant somewhere else put up in the, and uh, you know uh, feed the vicinity people in the vicinity so it's a very decentralized operation uh, also the technology is not uh, easily available Therefore, you need to have technology, you need to develop indigenous technology, um, you need to scout out uh, the successful people abroad uh, and, you know, get their technology here, uh, then indigenize the technology, uh, then also find out what are the important things for uh, a compressed biogas plant to succeed, the feedstock availability, the technology aspect, and then finally the offtake of gas by uh, the upgradation of gas, and then offtake of gas by the oil marketing companies. So there are these three, four different linkages, and unless all these three, four linkages work in unison uh, coherently, uh, it's very difficult for a compressed biogas manufacturer to really set up a plant and earn profits thereafter. And therefore, uh, people like us who have worked in the normal supply chain of oil and gas. And now come to biofuel, we know what is the difference of this supply chain, what are the different challenges here. I think people like us are in a best position to really uh, advise the new people in this field, uh, how to go about doing it, um, what kind of strategy to be adopted, and what's the best way forward. So I think this is how I look at my role as uh, evolving in the future. Exceptional. So our viewers would like to know, Mr. Milin, as an ESG and corporate governance expert, what values do you bring to the... Because this field is relatively new and not much is known. Okay, barring few listed companies and who are, you know, who are well into this kind of a job. Uh, I'm not talking about those kind of companies. And Bharat Petroleum is also one of them who have done a lot of work in CSR area and, uh, you know, societal and environmental upgradation area. But I think by and large, the corporates today have to understand that... Uh, Profit alone is not uh, something that is going to drive uh, their future. For the sustainability, for them to remain competitive in business, I think the time has come where shareholder is going to ask you that, look, you have given me dividend, you have given me bonus share also, you have done everything, you are giving me profits, but then uh, what about uh, the way you are carrying out your business? Um, uh, from your plants, the discharge is getting into rivers and rivers are getting polluted. I am concerned about that. And I am concerned about uh, the sewage treatment not being done. Um, or I am concerned about the pollutants being let out to the atmosphere, the sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, or maybe another element. So what are you doing? What is your plan doing to ensure that such fuels are used which uh, do not let out these poisonous gases in the uh, atmosphere? And so these are the questions shareholders are going to ask uh, now. They have already started asking. And now that is going to be the most important thing. And that is why we are looking forward towards things like carbon credits, green credits, which governments are going to come out with, where, you know, a polluting industry can buy carbon credits and industry which is really onto biofuels and ethanol and all that can really earn credits. And this kind of a uh, thing uh, will start operating and that is where a technology platforms also become very important. We can talk about it separately. But then the point I'm trying to say is that the ESG is very important. 
the society with whom you are working, the plants where you are operating, in your vicinity, what kind of societal development has taken place? Have we done anything to uplift the society, the people who are working? What about their families? What about their children? Where are, you know, where, whether there are schools uh, with adequate facilities uh, up to right up to 12th standard? I mean, so these are the basic things which every corporate, if they are to ensure that wherever they are putting up their plants in their vicinity, they are able to work around the uh, development of the society. I think that will go a very long way in the sustenance uh, of uh, such corporations. Yeah. All right. So since you mentioned technology, let's dive deeper into this subject. So here is my next question to you. What are some of the most remarkable changes you have seen in your field with changes in technology? That is part A. And what changes do you expect to see with the yeah. advent of IoT, AI, ML, blockchain, big data, Web 3.0, etc.? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's quite exciting. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, the technological changes, okay. Uh, I would say till 2000, of course, just the advent of computers and you know just doing basic things on computing and all that. But I think with uh, more and more data processing capabilities, I think came the networking requirement, and that is when the networking became very important. One of the things that I could see successfully getting implemented in the oil industry was that the entire database of the LPG customers of Indian Oil, Bharat Petroleum, Hindustan Petroleum, three main marketing companies at the back end was integrated. It was integrated and it was not just integrated, but even linked to the distributors uh, who are marketing, uh, the, distributing the uh, LPG cylinder and then the company itself and then companies plants bottling plants one side and the other side the uh, banks through which the payment is being made and therefore national payment corporation of india came into existence and then the banks came into so right from that bank to national payment corporation to oil integration of the database of oil companies and then distributor linkages the entire database of something like 26 crore consumers in this country was linked for the first time in 2011, 12, 13, 14. And uh, that is a huge technological leap that we took. The other technological initiatives I saw was the automation of the petrol pumps. The entire petrol pump is automated now. And uh, not just the petrol pumps are automated, but even they are linked to the installation from which they receive petrol. Uh, and even the lorry which carries the petrol, lorry, uh, the company knows now when lorry is carrying a petrol from a point to B point, which is 15 kilometers away, entire 15 kilometers away, the route is also mapped. The lorry cannot go here and there to do any mischievous kind of thing. The time is mapped. It left at 10 o'clock. It should reach at 11 o'clock. It has reached at 11 o'clock. If it does not reach at 11 o'clock, it reaches at 11.30. Somebody can call up. Uh, somebody does call up the driver. Why are you late? What are you doing in between? So basically using the GPS facility, using the entire uh, retail outlet automation network, we are able to do a very seamless, very seamless transfer of product from our installation to a petrol pump. And when it is billed to the consumer, everything is digitized, everything is recorded. You can go back to the petrol pump, say five days back, I took petrol. He can show you on a CCTV camera when you took petrol, what credit card you gave, how much you were billed, what was the quantity that you got, everything is available in database. So those kind, that kind of those kind of technology I have seen. The third, of course, is um, the uh, customer interface that I was able to implement and uh, digitally link it. Uh, we were also building uh, customer analytics on that, that depending on uh, the customers who have come to various petrol pumps, where all they have taken product from, when they have not taken, how much they have taken. So all that analytics, predictive analytics, that helps us in ensuring, uh, you know, uh, the uh, further sales and all that. So, so basically, those kind of things are being used currently. Now, coming to your question about future, yes, the future is getting very exciting because now we are talking about not just one company, but now the ecosystem. So, um, imagine, uh, like, well, let me come to this compressed biogas itself. Compressed biogas, there is a currently a natural gas pipeline running across the country and more and more pipelines will come. We would like to see a system where I develop one ton of compressed biogas somewhere, let's say in Punjab, and I am able to draw some kind of credit, say in Tamil Nadu. So when you have that national grid, all that can happen only when the blockchain comes. 
all that can happen when there is a seamless connection with all the intersecting partners the people who are producing compressed biogas the people who are uplifting compressed biogas the people who are transporting compressed biogas the all are connected seamlessly i think that is where things like blockchain technology and all are going to be very very important similarly solar electricity uh, that is already a very good example where you know people are generating electricity also consume electricity and they are being built by the net uh, uh, metering system so all that when that gets connected in the ecosystem i think that is where we are going to really leverage the power of uh, the kind of uh, technology that is going to come ai and of course is machine learning and all uh, more important in case of robotics and autonomous autonomous vehicles and things like that but i think it has its own implications um uh, ai and virtual reality or augmented reality when uh, so much of online shopping is there these days you need not physically visit uh, brick and mortar stores online itself you can try out various things and that is where uh, these platforms are going to be technology is going to be very very important and therefore going forward uh, for any industry i think it's very important that uh, they look at what is the best way to go forward what is the best technology that will propel them to ensure that they are able to meet their corporate objectives um, esg is of course on one side but when it comes to pure sales and marketing i think use of technology uh, is going to be immensely important uh, going forward because that will help you to not i won't say reduce manpower but optimize your manpower optimize your skill sets that are required at various places there are some areas where hard labor has to be there and it cannot be replaced but there are a lot of areas where i think you could reduce uh, or optimize a lot of manpower by just by just using technology in a far far better way in terms let's say analytics is business analytics is one big area uh, where a lot of things can be done so it's it's very exciting now yeah similarly thank you for sharing such amazing insights into different different subjects so this brings us to the last question of the session and here it is we are building a community of industry magnets the move is meant for cross pollination of knowledge and building a knowledge sharing community of corporate giants and industry experts so what are your thoughts about these initiatives taken by mr zishan pathan mr hevel mehta and the team of world development corporation oh it's an excellent initiative i mean uh, if this initiative was not there i would not be talking face to face with you because what happens is there are many people like me there are many people like me and they would like to contribute uh, to the development of uh, corporates you know uh, they would like to get into the boards and uh, as independent uh, directors they would like to definitely advise what is the best course of action while they themselves learn but i think is the use of 30 40 years of uh, experience uh, should not go waste and that is when the experience matters a lot um, i for one would like to really work with lot of young people uh who are there in the field and uh, at the same time exchange a lot of ideas knowledge and all that and see where we can continue with our old traditions but at the same time uh you know have the uh, technology and other things um, you know uh, augmented and uh, therefore i consider your initiative or the initiative from mr pathan mr rahman uh, is excellent because uh, you are able to give us this platform wherein we are able to come forward and then approach the industry and uh, you know uh, go there about so uh, very very important initiative and i found the content also uh, pretty organized well organized and there are few uh, uh, suggestions i have given here and there like you could give more examples and things like that but by and large i think that's excellent initiative let me compliment you on that initiative yeah great it was fantastic conversing with you and i'm confident that your insights will inspire future leaders Thank you, Mr. Thank Millet, for joining us today. Wish you the best for your future endeavors. Moreover, trust that this initiative by Directors Institute has unquestionably expanded the participants' understanding and enriched their minds. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.